Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. I'm Ryan Honeyman, a partner at Lyft Economy. My guest today is Professor Robin D.G. Kelly. Professor Kelly is the Distinguished Professor and Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair in U.S. History at UCLA. His research has explored the history of social movements in the United States, the African diaspora in Africa, Black intellectuals, music and visual culture, surrealism, and Marxism. He is a prolific author, having written a wide variety of essays in professional journals and general publications, and his books include Africa Speaks, America Answers, Thelonious Monk, Freedom Dreams, Hammer and Ho, and many, many more. Professor Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's great to be with you. So I'd like to start with just a general check on how you're doing. How are you doing right now? Just on a human on a human level. <laughs> oh, I'm okay. I'm just, you know, tired. It's supposed to be summer, but um, you know, the work never ends. And I'm an an old father taking care of, of a lot of people. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but other than that, I can't complain. You know, the political situation we're in is dire, though it was dire before that and has been dire for at least the last 40 years. And that's something we can also talk about. You know, this is an extension of neoliberalism in many ways. And, you know, given the crisis of democracy that has been the history of this nation, you know, I think about where to go, what to do, you know, and your work is very important because when we think about the question of democracy, oftentimes the economy is off the table. You know, we think democracy is about representation, the right to vote, making sure that people speak for us rather than being able to determine our own destiny. And that means the economy. I love it. And maybe, you know, just so folks can get a little context, can you tell us, I mean, there's a lot there, but maybe... How did you first get interested in the work? Like, just give folks a little bit of your background and like how you first got interested in this work that you're doing today. Well, you know, I credit my sister, <laughs> Makani Temba, who was an activist very early on, trained me, and our whole household, my mother, who, who's actually here, I'm taking care of her at the moment. We grew up in Harlem in the 60s and early 70s, very early 70s at a time when, on the one hand, there were movements that demanded the right to economic self-determination in a place like Harlem. Harlem, considered the capital of Black America, it was also a strong Dominican and Puerto Rican community, but it was a place full of poverty, but also full of federal programs that were dying at the time. They were like alive in the 60s and dying in the 70s that were meant to empower our low-income community, you know? And so when you're living in those circumstances, surrounded by movements like the Black Panther Party, like the Black Liberation Army, like the Young Lords, and they're sort of in your neighborhood, you can't help but come to some recognition that it takes, you know, people power to bring our community out of poverty, to bring our community out of police violence that was surrounding us all the time, unemployment, and so that was the grounds upon which we went to school and chose books we wanted to read and, and joined movements and organizations. So long story short, by the time I got to college, you know, I wanted to study political economy through history. You know, I mean, I went to graduate school because I read a book by Walter Rodney called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And though I ended up writing about other things, that book was very important because it explained that poverty, inequality, wasn't the fault of the poor. It wasn't the result of lack of education, though that's a factor. It wasn't the result of lack of initiative, but it was extraction. <laughs> in other words, we're producing wealth, but that wealth is not staying in our community. The colonies under, the, under British imperialism, French imperialism, Portuguese, you know, U.S., they're producing all kinds of wealth, you know, 
trying to understand how it's extracted, what the consequences are for people who live in the colonies and former colonies of Africa and throughout the rest of the world. That was the world we grew up in. And I, and I should say, I mean, some of your listeners are probably younger. Some might be my age. You know, I'm 60 years old now. Um, hard to believe. But in my days, like as a young person coming up in the 80s, there were certain theories, economic theories that were quite popular. And when I say popular, I mean way beyond economists, like dependency theory, you know, the idea of underdevelopment, the idea of neocolonialism. And then these theories were being applied to the United States, to urban communities. You know, this is before we entered the zone of the underclass, you know, the, the whole underclass debate, which basically said, you know, these people, it's kind of a, a version of a kind of cultural poverty argument that, you know, if these people could only, you know, get the proper training and education, you know, withhold gratification, save their money, you know, in other words, act kind of middle class, as if <laughs> that's how the middle class acts, right? But the fact is, you know, these theories of the underclass, theories of cultural deprivation were replacing the application of internal colonialism and dependency theory and these things. So, and I'm not saying these theories were perfect, but what I'm saying is that it gave us an anti-capitalist alternative for understanding our plight. That was the opening for me to study what I studied. You know. And can you give folks, you know, some listeners may be familiar with sort of anti-capitalism and some may not. Can you kind of just describe what that movement is and what it looks like? Right. So I come out of a particular political tradition. You know, I can't say that I'm fully wedded to it now. We could talk about that. But coming out of Marxism-Leninism. So this is one particular sort of strand of anti-capitalism, and that is socialism. So one thing I didn't mention was I was a member of, of the Communist Workers' Party at one point. I was a member of... McConney brought you uh, very, in, right? Very, very, very... Yeah. Yeah. She brought me in. She brought me in. We, we kind of came in almost together, though she, was, she had deeper ties than me. And I mentioned that because there were other sort of anti-capitalist or socialist alternatives that, that we were all involved in. I mean, McConney was also involved with what became the New African Movement or the Provisional Government for the Republic of New Africa, which had a socialist agenda. I mean, this is very important. It was nationalist, but they were socialists. They were basically very, very clear that capitalism wasn't the answer. So there were Black nationalist organizations. I was also in a study group, which is part of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, which also took a very socialist position. Its primary ideologue was a man named Kwame Ture, who people knew before as Stokely Carmichael, longtime civil rights activist, socialist, radical. And so this is the stuff we're reading in the 80s, you know? Now, I mention that and I say one strand because there are other strands of anti capitalism. Anarchism, for example, is another strand. There are some strands of sort of Fabian socialism, which is sort of like, you know, we can evol- through, through a kind of evolutionary process the state can be the means through which to evolve into a socialist agenda through things that look like the New Deal. So there's many, many different strands, but fundamentally, in terms of a definition, it's basically, you know, advocating for, fighting for, and trying to assemble uh, a structure that is not based on exploitation of labor, and I say human labor, animal labor, others, not based on solely on kind of commodity forms. That is to say, where you, the economy is based on buying and selling things for profit, and that profit somehow becomes the capital needs to generate other things. So anti-capitalism basically argues that capitalism is actually bad. You know, it's bad for workers, it's bad for the land, it's bad for the environment. It produces inequalities. Inequality is not a natural occurrence. And it's ideological as well. Anarchism is a slightly different version of anti-capitalism, which is a slightly different, in that the emphasis on decentralization, on eventually sort of moving away from the state as the arbiter. And I should say something just for clarification's sake. 
in the 19th century, I should mention, I, you did mention I'm a historian, so I, I can't help myself. Sorry about that. But in the 19th century, anarchism and socialism were not that far apart. In fact, they sometimes use the term anarcho-socialism or anarcho-syndicalism because the vision of socialism or socialists, the vision of Marxists in the late 19th century, was one of communism as the ultimate destiny for society. And communism basically means it's not socialism. It is what's presumed to be the stage after that. And that is with communism, real communism, the state withers away. The anarchists also want the state to disappear. You know, no one's loving state. That was the 19th century kind of, I don't want to say utopian, although I would say utopian or even romantic notion of socialism. We have people like Frederick Engels saying, uh, no, no, we want scientific. You know, that's a debate. But fundamentally, we've reached a point now in the 21st century where the anarchist side and the socialist side have split pretty far apart. And there are socialists who do think the state, um, not all of not all of them, who think the state in many ways is the savior, is the final arbiter, and that what they imagine socialism to be is where you're going to still have surplus extracted from labor, surplus extracted you know, which that goes into the state to do the work of providing what's called the social wage. That is all the things that people need that they shouldn't have to pay for, like housing or at least inexpensive housing, low income housing, like, you know, provisions for anyone who can't work, libraries, schools, all the public facilities that rose. And, you know, we're not going to pay for those things because they come out of the surplus of working people rather than that surplus going into the hands of the owners of capital. So in this vision, the state owns the capital and then manages it for the betterment of everyone else. Now, sadly, we've seen how that worked (laughs) in other socialist societies. We see how it works in China. And look, there are moments when the surplus actually goes to good. And many times... The surplus goes to the people in power. The hilarious thing about this, and again, my my um, hardcore communist friends get mad at me when I say these things, but you know, who are the richest people in China? Members of the Communist Party. Who are the richest people in, in Soviet Union when it was Soviet Union? Members of the Communist Party. <laughs> not all of them, not the low, low end comrades, but the fact of the matter is that what ends up happening is that unless there's some structure that could allow for real democratization, true decentralization, true ownership on the hands of those people who work, that's, and that should be everyone, then you're gonna, that surplus is going to end up in somebody's hands. You know? And what ends up happening is the one thing that the communist parties of China and the Soviet Union and other places have in common is that they run the state. They create the bureaucracy to manage that surplus and they could, without, and I'm not even saying they're doing this illegally, they could legally pocket that money. I'm not even talking about corruption. I'm talking about a structure that enables them to take on the role of management when the vision of socialism, the vision of syndicalism was no more managers. Managers are gone. Shoot, that was the vision of the Soviets. Back in the day, you know, during the Russian Revolution, the Soviets like, you know, we don't want management. We want workers' control. And what the, the Communist Party had to do was basically crush the Soviets in its original iteration, take the name, and make something out of it. You know, so I know some people are going to write you cursing me out no. for that, but I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> well, I think it leads to this, this thing that I'm struggling with, and I think a lot of people in this space struggle with, which is to what extent do we lean into the ideal versus make decisions in the now that are like the practical decisions. So for example, you know, one thing that's come up even within our own team is some of the work that I do is with companies who are are you familiar with the B Corp B Corporation movement? I sort guess. Of like yes, I know basically, I know about, yeah. you know, for profit companies who are committed to social and environmental responsibility. So like Patagonia, Ben and Jerry's, sort of, you know, trying to be better. 
so I work with those companies. And then there's also folks, you know, that are we're in community with and relationship with like, why would you ever work with like a Patagonia or Ben and Jerry's? Because they're just it's just lipstick on the pig, basically. And so I'm curious because they're like, we need regenerative, you know, worker owned cooperative, sort of returning the land to indigenous stewardship, which is all stuff we all like everyone supports that. But I think it's just the um if you go all the way, eventually you might end up in a fetal position of like, I can't move because everything I do potentially will have a sort of negative impact or is not the ideal decision. So I'm curious, what is the filter with which you've lived your life and made those decisions or ways that you can advise others to like make decisions in a way that allows them to live, but also like build that ideal, I think. Right. Well, that is the hard question because, you know, that term always comes up. Reformers reform versus non-reformers reform. That is to say that if you're going to make some changes in a system, um, they have to be changes that don't strengthen the system, you know. And working with companies, the B company sort of approach, I wouldn't oppose that. I don't think that's, these are things that don't necessarily, they don't undermine the system. And in some ways, one could argue they may even strengthen the system. However, what you're dealing with are actual real people who have real needs. And, you know, if there's any way to develop just even momentary projects that could be redistributive, right, that's great. And it's interesting because, you know, I'll get to the specific question, but there's one little sort of detour. And that is usually the distinctions made between working with government institutions, state, which supposedly are supposed to be in the hands of the people through a democracy. So like participatory budgeting, for example, getting minimum wage laws passed, or living wage laws, I should say, passed for in cities and municipalities, you know, defunding police, which is an economic as well as political, social act and safety act. These are important, one important domain. The other domain, as you're saying, is working with private companies that are trying to make a profit for shareholders. And there's ways to sort of struggle with these. One way is, you know, I think about Rolling Jubilee, which is a debt relief project where they were doing many, many different things. But one of the things they did was, again, go to private banks and those who own the loans, own the debt on these student loans. And just like any venture capitalist, you know, they would go and buy the debt, you know, through crowdsourcing or whatnot for pennies on the dollar and then forgive the debt. And you could say, well, you know, it's great. It's great for people whose debt was forgiven. There's no question about that. They're vulture, I should say, venture. They're venture and vulture capitalists. You know? <laughs> so these are vultures, but they're they're but they're up there. They're like good vultures. So they're taking that debt. They're they're erasing it. And you know, members. I know a lot of people in the in Rolling Jubilee and the Debt Collective. They were like that worked for a while, but you know what? That's not a long term strategy, because in the end, the people who own the debt they get some of their money back, and we're paying for that. We shouldn't have to pay at all. So, but still, that work was so important because it did three things. One, it drew attention to the debt and the debt problem. Two, they were able to cancel actual personal student debt that made a difference in people's lives that could go forward. Um, and three, it led to a debate, a struggle within the organization to decide what might be a better strategy. So sometimes you can't get the point C until you go through B, you know? And I'm not saying that there are stages that you have to go through, because that's my my critique of the whole communism thing. But rather, it just so happens that when we look at it historically, they did go through that to get to this other point of thinking about other ways and thinking about ways of using civil disobedience and refusal, debt strikes, as a way to force companies, force the government particularly to step in and pay off that debt. And of course, in the end, even the government paying off the debt's jacked up. <laughs> they just need to cancel it. But we're st- we're still fighting this fight. So I think there's all kinds of value, and that every single act has value, even if that value 
is the lesson learned, you know, about what the limits are. Before I end on this, I just want to point to examples because part of what you asked me was like, well, what can people do? Um, I think there's some beautiful examples. Of course, my sister lives in Jackson, Mississippi, and they have some great examples. Cooperation Jackson is, is an ideal example of, of economic democracy. It's hard work because Jackson is a city with fewer resources than a place like New York City or Los Angeles. But with the resources they have, they're able to actually you know, model economic democracy. The other place, of course, is Detroit, where the James and Gracie Boggs Center and the community at large has been doing amazing things with very little in terms of strategies that are not necessarily like the visionary socialist strategies that people, the apocalyptic strategies of seize the state and, you know, implement socialism, but on a small scale, like in terms of their fight with the state, you know, fighting against the privatization of water, you know, pushing against the use of emergency managers who are basically stripping the city of Detroit and all of Michigan, actually, of, of democracy, but also doing things like time banking, you know? I mean, cooperatives, of course, with time banking, you know, like we, you, we see time banking when you work for a cooperative or when you work for a school that's cooperatively run where, you, you know, you trade some time uh, or turning empty lots, for example, into urban farms to deal with food insecurity, you know, to deal with joblessness and also to deal with something which I think is even bigger. That is a sense of alienation within a community where people come together to grow things together, right? Imagine what it means, right, to A, fight for municipal-owned power grid, right? That's one possibility. Another is to create your own power grid, you know? And, you know, we don't think of these things, but in Detroit, they're using solar energy and things like that, wind, water, to create forms of energy available for free, artists, engineers, and others are making these things so people can go off the grid. And these are all sustainable forms of green energy. You know, so I think that there are solutions. Some of them are short-term, some of them are long-term. Sometimes the short-term solution creates the conditions for long-term vision. Because the one thing, and this is something I, I drilled down on in my book, Freedom Dreams, is it's in the act of trying to figure out the problem to improve people's lives in struggle, whether it's based on kind of internal organization and you know, transforming, say, you know, using land trust, for example, to create something, or if it's like protesting against the state, you know, or if it's something that's in between that, like coming up with a community benefits agreement where, you know, a company can't come into the east side of Detroit, uh, you know, like, like Fiat, for example, unless it's willing to invest in low income housing and, you know, living wage and there's no opposition to the union, that kind of stuff. There's all kinds of ways to deal with this. But no matter what you do, there's, there are two really important outcomes. One, is that the process is always a learning process, is always an, an ideological one, where the long-term vision and the short-term sort of stopgap measure are not separate things. It's not an either-or. They're entwined together, just like rope. You know, that's how we, we move forward. But then the second thing is that it is people power, and especially young people. They can see the ability of people coming together to fight for something and sometimes win. And what they, the lesson for me is that, you know, you don't need to go to a think tank to figure it out. You don't need to bring in a high paid consultant to figure it out. People are figuring it out on the ground. And that is a, to me way more important than whether or not you're able to figure out everything you need to figure out. I love that answer. And I wanted to just clarify something that you said, I think is potentially really powerful is, you know, one of the things, one of the premises, uh, and I keep, you know, sort of talking about the B Corp movement, just because 
I'm sort of involved with that. And I really like love your opinion on this because one of their premises, one of their their premises, we're using business as a force for good, and I think I assume that you might argue that that's not really. It's not that it's not possible. It's just it's not the full solution, clearly. And I think that you said something earlier around, you know, working with a private company is not necessarily undermining the system and it may even strengthen the system. Could you say more Mm -hmm. about that? I think that's really, yeah. Sure. And that is an absolute fact that sometimes, you know, and there's different ways to think about it, but but many times when we are strengthening the ability of a firm, a company to make profits, either through, let's say, the shift to green energy, which I'm all for, you know, I mean, and I'll give you some historical examples. You know, one of the most important moments in the 20th century labor movement was the formation of the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. And they came into being through sit-down strikes, through militant activities. And what made them different from the AFL was that this was an industrial union. They were, I mean, there were some, some workers they excluded, you know, but for the most part, they're like, we're going to get the whole industrial workforce in the union. And that looked good, right? It looked great. You know, they're, they're fighting for power. They're competing, contesting power with big corporations. But once they become a big union, and once they merge with the AFL, AFL and they become the AFL-CIO, then they become the lever for virtually the entire labor movement. Why does that matter? Because when companies need a stable labor force that won't go on strike, they turn to the unions. So the unions were great and still are to fight for for justice, for better wages, for better working conditions, for safety. But what happens when your union leadership now in bed with companies in some way, at least allied with them, says to the workers, look, you know, we're going to negotiate this contract and, you, you know, you all should sign it. And then half the workers are like, no, we're not going to sign it. We're just going on strike. Like, no, that's a wildcat strike. It's unauthorized. And then suddenly that becomes a source of, of tension. Whereas that's why sometimes big corporations actually like unions. At least they liked them up to the 1970s. <laughs> you know, there's a, the time of, of capitalist expansion when it was a good thing. To go back to companies today, there are ways to make companies more amenable to the needs of Communities and consumers, right? No GMOs. Oh, great. You know, we're going to make sure that we hire people with disabilities. Fantastic. You know, we're going to have no integrated workforce. You know, we're going to really practice diversity. Fantastic. We're going to hire a diversity person, pay them a quarter of a million dollars a year to basically teach us how to be more diverse. Oh, wonderful. And in the end, they're still extracting value and wealth. And if anything were to happen, like inflation, they're not going to be like, you know what? We're going to give up our CEO pay. We're going to, in fact, we're going to take zero dollars in order to redistribute our wealth to make sure that our workers are all employed and that our prices are low. <laughs> you know, they're not going to do that. On the other hand, there's something to say about the ability of people organize, two things, the ability of people organize to be able to push a company to be responsive. This goes back to the Fiat company in East Detroit, where you force them through an agreement to say, you must build low-income housing. That is part of the terms of you coming in here. You have to pay. And that, to me, is not about making business more efficient. It's about recognizing that that the point of business, for the most part, is to exploit the rest of us through price gouging, through paying people less than a living wage, whatever it takes, through reinvesting their surplus, not back into that community, but reinvesting in other things like banking, you know, loans. I mean, one of the amazing things about General Motors in Flint, for example, was that you know, when they stopped making, when they couldn't make as many cars as they could and started, you know, shipping out jobs from Flint, Flint, what did they do? They went to finance and they began 
to finance first automobiles. That makes sense, right? Then they started financing houses. And then next thing you know, they're deep in the subprime mortgage business. So the same company who got tax breaks, tax breaks from the city of Flint, you know, based on the promise that they're going to stay and keep those jobs there in Flint. As soon as they could, it's like, you know what? We can't do this. We're cutting out. But, you know, we're going to reorganize our portfolio to basically give loans to people who are struggling and make them homeowners through predatory lending and make money that way. (laughs) So there's ways that on the one hand, you're looking and you're thinking, okay, they're going to be good to us, but they're not. Which brings me to the final thing. And that is the distinction between businesses as we know them and what is called, as you know very well, the solidarity economy. And the solidarity economy, which you could see in places like Jackson, you could see it in Detroit and elsewhere, is this idea, which includes things like time banking and cooperatives. It's the idea is that you know you think really hard about how to plan for the economic needs of the community and make it sustainable under capitalism. So we're not going to overthrow, we can't overthrow capitalism at the moment. What we can do is figure out a way through something as basic as 3D printers, right, to make things that people need. And they pay for those things. They pay for those things either through cash, through not so much credit, or through time banking or trade. And we're thinking, like, how do you make an economy that's still based on the exchanging of commodities that's not predatory? I mean, it's not impossible to do. It just takes thought. It takes community involvement. It takes planning. It takes vision. And that's what, to go back to the great scholar W.B. Du Bois, I mean, he'd been thinking about this since he did a report in 1907 about Black cooperatives. You know, and then went on to write articles about the nation within a nation of black organizations, economic organizations, you know, really figuring out how to attend to the needs of a community in a way that's not profit mongering, that's not exploitative. You know, that's, and let me just, I'll be honest with you, that's very hard to do nowadays ideologically and culturally. And why is that? And I'm not talking about you and me and and our friends, but the vast majority of people who are around me, especially a lot of young people, are enamored with wealth completely. And so not only wealth for themselves, but take great pride in, in the wealth accumulated by others, you know? And I'll give you a concrete example. You know, I remember I wrote this article about Jay Z. It was about other things too, but Jay Z was like the center of it. And, you know, one of the points that I made was that Rockaware, you know, his clothing company was being made by sweatshop labor in Central America with people getting paid, you know, 25 cents an hour, sometimes just piecework and working in situations that were just horrendous and unlivable, you know, and, and we're running out buying his clothes. Well, you know how much flack I got from people like, how would you, why are you going to diss Jay-Z? You know, he's an entrepreneur. He's a billionaire. Like, as if somehow we should get on our knees and be happy about that, you know? But this idea, which is is not unique to the Black community, it's a deeply American idea, the Horatio Alger myth, that when you see wealth, when you see the Vanderbilts, and the Rockefellers and the Carnegies walking around in their fancy clothes, in their cars and carriages or whatever it is, that that is something to aspire to. And that maybe one day if you work hard, you can have that too. And then be happy to them for their largesse. So you just exploited all these immigrant steel workers. <laughs> you took all their money and killed half of them you know, in the workplace, and then they're going to put a library in your name. Thank you, Andrew Carnegie. So this is my biggest fear, that, that part of moving forward to thinking about what even a stopgap measure would look like, a solidarity economy, that requires a rethinking of a sort of a new cultural revolution, you know,
I mean, imagine when people think about China's success, what do we see? We see China's wealth. We don't see, you know, sweatshop labor. So sweatshop labor is examples of its failure. Wealth is an example of its success. <laughs> really, we could do better than that. What a success is where everyone is able to have everything they need and live a happy life and without necessarily having the, the huge gaps of wealth accumulation, which, you know, in living here in Los Angeles, where every other car is Lambo, Bugatti, Rolls Royce, Bentley, you know, it's really hard for my children to just be normal people and say, you know, we want revolution. You know, my, my daughter, she's 11 years old. She calls herself the bourgeoisie. <laughs> she says, I'm, she goes, well, you know, we don't, I said, I talk about the bourgeoisie. So, well, no, we're going to win. <laughs> I said, who are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Being bougie is like, uh, it's like, a good thing, right? Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> you it's can't scary. get a Bugatti on the UCLA uh, salary. You know, n- <laughs> n- <laughs> I'm sure that all the coaches can. They, they're getting paid. You know, I think one thing that we sort of need to touch on is how race ties into all of this, and is you've talked and talked and. Ex- extensively on how you know capitalism is dependent upon racism like they're inseparable and i'm curious if you could for folks who maybe haven't heard you speak about this can you just talk about how the intersection how capitalism is dependent upon racism and and how they sort of play off each other exactly well there's a term that's being used very commonly now which is racial capitalism and i didn't invent it cedric robinson didn't even invent it although it's attributed to him uh, if you go back to his book, Black Marxism, um, published in 1983, it was used in South Africa in the 70s, although with a slightly different meaning. So what do we mean by racial capitalism? It, the racial, just like gendered capitalism, is an adjective. And it's not to say it's an adjective that signals a type of capitalism. In other words, it's not like there's a non-racial capitalism. It simply signals that Race, racial categories themselves, and capitalism are co-constitutive, which is to say they they emerge, I wouldn't say they emerge together. And racism precede capitalism, just like gender and gender difference, patriarchy, precede capitalism. So the point is, is that there's no way that capitalism is going to emerge. And by the way, capitalism has a long history. I mean, it goes back to you talking about merchant capital and banking in the Venice, right, and or Genoa in the 12th century. So it's been around, but race goes back before that. So the ground upon which capitalism emerges in all of its iterations, industrial, merchant, you know, neoliberal, it's a ground that's already racial, racialized and gendered. So all that means is that capitalism extracts wealth in structures value, value meaning the price of, of commodities, wages, price of land, by assigning differential value to human life and labor. Differential could be by gender, by race, by ethnicity, by nationality, but differential value. So what do I mean by differential value? In other words, differential value determines who is targeted for dispossession, who could be dispossessed and who can't, who's targeted for slavery. And look, slavery was pretty universal, you know, but there was a time in which slavery becomes more racialized. Who's targeted for lower wages? Who, you know, and I do the test, go to any restaurant. Who's working in the kitchen? Who's busing? Who's the chef? You know, and you could see there's a kind of racial hierarchy there. I mean, unless you're in certain parts of Ohio where nothing but poor white people, then, you know, it's like, it's still racialized in the sense that, if you're a white person in Ohio from Kentucky, you know, you will know you're going to be at the lower ends of the, of the totem pole. But nevertheless, it has to do with who is subjected to predatory lending, to disfranchisement, who is considered to be migrant labor. That's a racialized category. Something as fundamental as property values. It's the trickiest, weirdest thing in America that you can have the exact same house, exact same square footage. <laughs> 
exact same yard. In fact, it could be the same condition. And you live in an all black or uh, Latinx community and have that same house in another neighborhood that's all white, your house will be worth a lot less. And it, this is determined not just by a smell test or just racist individuals, it's determined by the federal government that determines the value based on the loans that federal governments give, the federal government gives. And we can go on and on and on. Regressive taxation, for example. You know, when you, if the property values go down in your neighborhood because of race, then yes, you may be paying less in terms of property taxes, though the percentage may not be the same. However, those same poor people are buying commodities at their stores some of the stores are not discount stores, but stores where store owners are forced to pay higher insurance rates because of the threat of crime and violence, or they could just charge more because they don't really think the, they're going to get much pushback from the community for inferior products. And so what does that mean? And I'll give you a really concrete example. So you're paying for the stuff. You're like, you know what? I can't shop here. I'm going to the suburbs. And we have a place, we have suburbs in California. You live in South LA. You say, I'm going to go to Lakewood and shop there. And then you get there. And yes, you know, it's like the price is a little cheaper. The produce is better. You got malls. You go to JCPenney's, get your kids some clothes. Come to find out that the malls and the shopping centers in the suburbs are charging like a 1% you know, excise tax as part of the tax, which they're able to reinvest in their communities. So this is called the Lakewood Plan. This is where in the 1950s, they're like, you know, we we don't really want as much, you know, we want to reduce our property taxes. So they reduce their property taxes by literally charging an additional tax on shoppers. If those shoppers are coming from poor neighborhoods, which many are, they're paying to reduce the tax, property taxes on middle class and wealthy people. That's a regressive tax. That's to say that they're spending so much on sales tax. And sales tax, the thing is, poor people pay the same percentage of ta- sales tax as rich people. It's a regressive tax as opposed to progressive. That's like another example of that. And that's not even getting to all the other aspects of racial capitalism, tied to the welfare state, financialization, deregulation, tax breaks and bailouts. Because the flip side is that whereas black and brown and indigenous peoples are paying this excess, rich people are getting breaks and bailouts and you know subsidies and things that are not happening. So you got subsidies for corporations to basically go in and bulldoze neighborhoods. And meanwhile, the welfare state is crumbling, disappearing, and people are struggling just to get by. That's what racial capitalism looks like. I really appreciate that. And did I hear you say that, are you based in South LA? Well, no, I'm based in, well, I'm in okay. Los Angeles. So I'm, I'm like, sort of like West, it's, I say West Hollywood area. We have one of our former podcast guests and one of our investees from one of our funds is Community Services Unlimited in South LA. Um, mm-hmm. So I thought right. you were there. Well, it was hilarious. So if you were to look me up under Wikipedia, it says that that my wife and I live in a place called View Park, which is part of South, a section of South LA. It's not quite as South. And we've never lived there. I mean, they, and so every time I change it, they're like, you know, you're not authorized to change it. We feel so, there's a conflict of so, interest so, in this uh, Wikipedia post. You know, I'm, but my wife was like, that's good. Let them think yeah. we live in View Park because then they'll never find us. <laughs> well, but it's interesting because this question of neighborhood does matter in terms of, of, again, one's access to good services and wealth, you know. And so South LA is a place where there are efforts amazing efforts, actually, in terms of cooperative economics. You mentioned one. If I can just mention another one very quickly. There's a great artist named Lauren Halsey, who is a wonderful sculptor, installation artist. And she her studio is based in South LA. She grew up there. 
And she created a community center called Summer Everything, which provides for free organic food for low-income communities, especially the projects, the Nickerson Garden projects here in L.A. And this is what she does. She could be making huge amounts of money just selling work, but she puts that her resources into helping that community and then bringing the community in to help box the food and deliver it and provide jobs for people. So things like that can happen and they are happening. And I want to be respectful of your time too. So I'm, maybe I have two more questions for you. One of the things we like to ask guests is, what do you need right now? And how can the listeners help you grow this next economy or the solidarity economy? Or So what do we need? Well, what do you need though? For, uh, it can be about you too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need any. I have everything. I have everything I've ever wanted and more. I think in terms of what do we need, which I think is, is a really important question. I appreciate the question. You know, and this is why the podcasts like these are so important. We sometimes underestimate what we call political education. You know, we think okay, well, the people should know, or they should know, or the people know. They just know because they're the people. And we kind of put the people, wherever they are, on this pedestal, or we treat them like they're all ignorant and stupid. And political education is actually respecting people's intelligence, recognizing their ability to think critically, but also knowing that they're being assaulted. I mean, assaulted. We are being assaulted by not just misinformation, but a kind of ideological, neoliberal common sense, which is really, really dangerous. This idea that there's only one way to think about the economy, and that is through kind of game theory, neoclassical theory of economy, or that economies are strictly based on you know, supply and demand, and it's natural. It's just sort of the natural thing, the, the invisible hand. Or that what we need to do to get an economy going is to reduce taxes on the wealthy so that they could give us jobs. You see, that's what's holding us back. It becomes a common sense, and I don't blame people for that, but we need alternative ways of understanding economy. Uh, we need ways of not only that, but we need a new culture in which the things that we value are not shiny things, expensive things. Because, and I was just talking about this this morning, you know, it's not an accident that a country like Colombia, right, or Chile, that these two places would have these like left insurgencies and victorious presidential campaigns on a left agenda. Why is that? It's not because, it's be precisely because people are so desperate. And what I mean by that is that, and I'm not saying it's all working class poor people, it's across the board. But what I mean by that is that it was a mass protest in the streets against austerity, against starvation, against the price of fuel. All these things generated opposition. And that brought down existing governments and opened up the space for alternatives. In the United States, we keep prolonging the inevitable because of credit. In other words, as broke as we can be, you can always get another credit card and get the shiny object you need. Sometimes it's about getting food, and that's true. And that's great. But a lot of times, I like when I walk around my neighborhood and I see these people drive, they're not paying cash for those cards. You know, some of them are leases. <laughs> You know, so there's a way in which the American economy is in many ways driven by debt in a way that is even more pronounced than the debt ridden economies of the global south. But it's just different. It's like it's not the average consumer in debt ridden economies, whereas here it is every consumer. And that allows us to keep reproducing the mythology that if you just work hard enough or get enough credit cards, you can actually look like they do on the YouTube videos. You know, you too can drive a car like this. And that's a dangerous culture that we're living in that has to be reversed. 
and reversing it requires something much bigger than trying to, to draw on people's morality because that's we have a lot of work to do to do that. I think it's important, but we have to do that as well. And then the other irony, of course, is that in terms of Latin America, almost all the countries that have been overthrown, left regimes overthrown by the United States or backed by the U.S., there's always this lesson like, oh, you should have armed the people, should have armed the people. And maybe that's true. But we live in a country where the people are armed, <laughs> armed to the teeth. We have more guns here than any place in the world. And the fear, and of course, the scary thing is that most of those people are armed to defend the Supreme Court's position on Roe v. Wade, not to overthrow it. And that's where we are. That's where we are. This is the one, the country where you can get a subscription to Guns and Garden. That says that's every, a real magazine. <laughs> it's a real magazine, Guns and Garden, and you can learn about gardening and have guns. It's really f- it's for women, right? For a particular kind of political orientation. Well, last question here. How can we learn more about your work? And if you have any books upcoming to shout out, any events or anything like that, if you want to. Yeah, well, I guess two things very quickly. I'm very happy that there will be a 20th anniversary edition of Freedom Dreams released in August. And we're doing a lot of events around that. It has a brand new introduction, which covers the last 20 years. And then a new wild epilogue that talks about Detroit and Jackson, Mississippi, by the way. And I'm finishing this book called Black Body Swinging, an American Postmortem, which is about state violence. But mostly it's a, think of it as an abolitionist history of racial capitalism and resistance to it. Any social media or website folks can go to if they want to learn more? You know what? I'm just terrible at stuff like that. I, I'm, I'm a non-self promoter. I, I have a Facebook page. I know McConaughey runs, runs it. it. So I, <laughs> yeah, Yes. <so, laughs> whenever people, when, whenever someone writes the Facebook page and they, they, you know, they get an answer, it's not me. It's my sister. I, I'm off of Twitter, you know, which I think is toxic sometimes. But I'm perfectly good, happy with, you know, if people can find my stuff, great. You know, they could email me and I'll probably get back to them. Other than that, you know, I'm still just trying to be a student. Well, Professor Kelly, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. And uh, I feel like we could go another couple hours. Might have to have you back. Yes, of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah, Ryan, it's, it's really great to talk to you finally and look forward to more conversations in the future. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L I F T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.